money is a is an abstract concept you see in human life everything other than our physical body needs is a myth right so so many people say religion is a myth you know race uh, religion caste everything is a myth and we we have needed that to be able to function together the other fascinating thing right like uh, whenever currencies seem to go out of trust or out of fashion alternate seems to be either gold or cigarettes which is <laughs> Like, you know, or, or, or currently, at least so far, the dollar, right? So, oh, there, yeah, there another are, currency, yeah. Like, you know, El Salvador, uh, no, yep. even Argentina is is contemplating dollarizing the economy, correct? Like, you know, or pegging it to the dollar, pegging it to yeah. the dollar. Actually, they they want to dollarize the economy. The the two most important rights are you control the army, so you have monopoly on violence. That people will listen to the government because. they are the ones who control the army and they can force you to listen and the second is that you control the mint which is that you are you get the right to print hi and welcome to another discussion on open dialogue today's discussion is a master class with nilkant today we will discuss a topic that is central to all our lives but also is extremely abstract the topic for the conversation today is money i have today with me uh, nilkant mishra uh, who you met before nilkant is the chief economist at uh, axis bank he is also a part of the prime minister's economic advisory council he is also the chairman of the uidai so nilkant welcome and i really look forward to this conversation uh, so am i thank you Great. So Nilkan, let me start uh, with a little cheeky question. Yeah, I have with me a hundred rupee note. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I'm going to read what's what's written here, right? So it says, yeah. uh, "I promise to pay the bearer the sum of one hundred rupees," and it's signed by the governor. So I have one observation and two questions. Mm-hmm. So observation number one is that obviously, kind of this itself is not one hundred rupees, right? It, it's it, a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. It it feels like a security. With yep. it, it says that I will give you one. So my two questions are the following. The first one is that if say somebody did thought experiment, somebody went to the RBI and gave them this hundred rupee note and said, "Look, you promised to pay me hundred rupees, so please give me hundred rupees." So what will he get? So this is uh, happening as we say as we speak, right? So people are taking the two thousand rupee notes and giving it back to their banks, right. and they're getting credit in their bank accounts. Right. Okay. So that now this was a little kind of cheeky, frivolous question, mm-hmm. but my more important question number two is that. if this is not money then what is money money is a is an abstract concept uh see in human life uh everything other than our physical body needs is a myth right so so many people say religion is a myth uh you know race uh, religion caste everything is a myth and we we have needed that to be able to function together yep so this has a value of 100 rupees because all of us believe that it has a value of 100 rupees you, you, you would you would remember you know uh, the hindi phrase that you know footi kodi ke barabar nahi hai because footi kodi was a unit of account right, right. It, was, it was a form of money right and it was actually a footi kodi right <laughs> uh, so the invention of paper money was just a replacement earlier people would exchange beads uh, there is this fascinating story in in a book by milton friedman called money mischief where uh there is this island uh in the pacific ocean where uh there were giant rocks with holes in the middle which were considered money right and the the fascinating thing is that the richest family there had a massive uh sort of block of rock which was actually in the middle of the ocean so they had they had tried to carry it from the neighboring island and the ship sank and for generations people said that that is the wealthiest family though their wealth was actually at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> right. so money is is a myth yep. it is it is something that uh, is necessary for all of us to function yep. for the economy to function uh, but at the abstract level uh, it it is and we we been through demonetization right i mean suddenly the piece of paper that you held was actually not very valuable right uh and uh, uh but it is it is absolutely essential uh, for the economy to function great so uh, so what you are saying nilkant is basically money is like religion 
and which means that uh, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, but you know it exists because you believe and everybody believes that it exists. Correct. Uh, and by the way, if everybody stopped believing that it existed, then you know, then it has no, and no value. And we had that during demonetization. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. So now, uh, moving to the next step now, so, you know, central banks obviously are the source of creating the money and so on and so forth, right? So how do they decide that how much money to create? And you know, how do they think about this dynamic of whether the money is enough, too much, too less, etc. So uh, <clears throat> there was a time when uh, the quantity theory of money was considered very important. Right. Right. In the last uh, 30 years, globally at least, people have stopped looking at, or at least central bankers or monetary theorists have stopped looking at the quantity of money. And what is the quantity theory, if I may ask? Uh, basically, that how much money is there, right? So, how much is M0, how much is M1, M3, how much is M2? And I guess we'll discuss at that at some point. But how much money exists in the economy right. uh, was at one point considered very important to think control things like inflation. Uh, because if you print too much money, then and you know there's only so much economic activity, then the money gets debased, it gets, gets devalued. Right. Now, uh, in India, uh, what I think the RBI targets is to have a certain level of base money, uh, which is growing at this more or less the same pace uh, as the nominal GDP. Right. So basically nominal GDP being the, the value of activity and the pace at which it is growing. Because remember that money is needed for as, as a medium of exchange and therefore there has to be sufficient money uh, for for the economy to function and there I must give you a very uh, very interesting example the first historical evidence of quantitative easing was in AD 30 when okay. when the Roman Emperor Tiberius right uh, he was so efficient at tax collection and at that time there was no paper money uh, and there were no electronic and digital money so it was only physical money which right. was coins right and uh, he was so good at tax collection that his treasury was full of tax, right? And there was not enough money in the economy. And then the economy started slowing down. Right. Uh, so what he did was he then lent money to the patricians, basically the, the, the elites, who then started spending that money and the, the economy got liquidated. So there is a certain amount of money that you need for the economy to function properly. Uh, in general, uh, sort of, uh, having having a rule of thumb where nominal GDP and base money growth are sort of in line or maybe close to each other is a is a reasonable assumption. Uh, the uh, but the be better measure is is at a broad money level, right? Basically, uh, see M zero, which is the base money, is is currency in circulation plus bankers' deposits with RBI. If you add to that the the uh, demand deposits and then you add to that the time deposits, you actually get to M2. Uh, so M2 growth or India case M3 growth, uh, I think if it is in line with nominal GDP growth, then you have a very stable and based economy. So sorry, Nilkat, I'll just mm -hmm. jump in here because lots of technical terms came in. So maybe we should spend time on this M0, M1, M2 mm -hmm. uh, just before, before we move on. Before yeah. we move on, right? Uh, so M0 is base money, right? It is currency in circulation plus banks deposits with the central bank, right? So sometimes the banks, when they, when they, you know, so like our bank, uh, if say uh, uh, we, we got 100 rupees of extra deposits today and the extra money we lent out is only 60, we have 40 rupees left at the end of the day and we can lend it to someone else in the overnight market or we can just give it back to the RBI that keep it parked so that I need it tomorrow. And also banks have these statutory uh, reserves like the CRR, CRR is also part of this. Correct, system. exactly. So, uh, so these are reserves that you keep at the central bank. So if you add those, that becomes base money. So at a, at a very broad level, you can say it is currency in circulation, right. like coins, and no, uh, coins and notes and all that. Over that, if you, if you add uh, uh, demand deposits, uh, uh, then you get to a different definition which is called M1. And demand deposits is savings accounts and current accounts. Correct. So, so uh, that, that you can, that it's very liquid, right. that you can get access to it very quickly. Right. Because currency in circulation or the physical currency is the most liquid yep. of, of, all in, of all money. 
uh, demand deposits can also be money because you can exchange it uh, for for currency and uh, with with very little friction if you add some more friction you get to m2 which is where you add time deposits these uh, are fixed deposits fds fixed deposits and fds and all that because you cannot liquidate it that easily will, yeah right that easily uh, if you add to that money market funds then you get to m3 right uh, because there are money market funds also with a one two day lag you can you can get access to that money which are uh, like this overnight funds etc that you know people can like corporates a lot of corporates park money into the uh, exactly. money market right yes. uh, and then there are other high, higher higher measures called m4 for example if you are holding someone's loan now if you want to add all of that then becomes m4 but uh from a from a monetary management perspective most countries stop at m2 and m3 right uh, because those those are the liquid forms of money which in some ways the the central bank can control so uh coming back to your first question if your nominal gdp growth that is the value of your total output not just the volume volume is real gdp value is real gdp plus price growth if the volume of uh, or the value of your uh, economy is growing at say 10 or 12% then it is reasonable to assume that Uh, broad money growth or M2 or M3 growth. So some countries target M2, some t- countries target M3. India does M3, uh, US does M2. Uh, that growth should be in line with nominal GDP growth. There is also this issue of currency in circulation. Now, currency in circulation is something which is um, which is more demand driven. So it is more a replenishment based system. basically if too many people or if a lot of people start withdrawing money from atms atms go empty then the banks need to replenish that uh, and then they will all go to the regional rbi office demand more currency and then that whole supply chain then goes back to the central mint more currency is printed and starts to get circulated but what the central banks target is uh, is is m0 as well as broad money growth right great now going back to the 100 rupee note nilkant uh, so basically the rbi in this case is saying that i owe you 100 rupees uh, which means it's a liability for the central bank correct and you know we know that every liability has an equivalent asset against it so what exactly is an asset against the uh, 100 nothing rupees? that's the magic of of uh, of of seniorage and the magic of the authority see when you become the ruler of a country what what rights do you get right right so the the two most important rights are you control the army so you have the the monopoly on violence right that that people will listen to the government because they are the ones who control the army I and mean, they can force you to listen to them and the second is that you control the mint which is that you are you get the right to print so uh the rbi or any central bank is is an arm of the government um, and the government which is the monopoly uh is the is the is the leviathan as as you know political theory will tell you is uh is then uh delegating the power of printing money to the central bank so effectively it is the government printing it uh and the government and you know so and this has been the, the case through 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 ages that uh the right to issue currency was that of the state uh and no one else has that authority and and that. so in a way this is like a zero coupon bond right so if the government uh, decides to borrow say 100 crore rupees you can just print currency and and give it to people uh, for them to spend but of course they will want something in return uh, uh, occasionally they can just do it for like you know when when like what the us did recently where they just distributed funds to all of their citizens correct and uh, that borrowing came by the printing of money by by the federal reserve it's a liability without an end date correct so that's a, another very interesting concept right so that brings me to the second thing that i wanted to show you uh, this is a print out obviously uh, this is a 100 trillion dollar note uh, this is from zimbabwe uh, the way i discovered it is that uh, my son had a, a school project and he had to talk about currencies and i was doing some google search and i found this and i found it very interesting and then kind of he went and spoke i'm sure it is worth more uh, that that piece of paper is worth more than what it what, is what because is it. it is because i just found out that uh, the worth of this when it, before it was decommissioned was about 40 cents mm-hmm. uh so so what is the story here like how does a piece of currency get to 100 100 trillion dollars and still is valued only at 40 cents because see uh, 
as we discussed right at the beginning of our conversation, uh, the value of that piece of paper is, is what everyone agrees the value of that piece of paper is. So, if the sovereign starts to overdo it, meaning they start printing a lot more um, than is necessary, then the value of the currency starts to drop. Right. And uh, the sign of that is inflation. That if uh, the fact that the same 100 rupee note, if you say we are at 5% inflation, one year later, it can buy 5% less uh, than it does today. So, inflation is uh, a, a devaluation, devaluation of the currency uh, over a over a sustained period. And uh, so, so what the, what the Zimbabwean government did and there have been other very famous instances like China in the 1940s, uh, Germany the, after World War II, yeah. Weimar Republic uh, 1920s, um, where we have had issues of hyperinflation. In yeah. fact, uh, someone would say Argentina had gone through it yeah. recently, Venezuela is going through it. So, uh, so, so but, but when, when that starts to happen, people start finding alternatives. And this is the funny thing about money that uh, if you don't, if the, the government does not give you money, then they will find alternatives. Uh, yeah. Like in Germany after the Second World War, cigarettes, cigarettes were a form yes. of currency. <laughs> yeah. Right. So people used to sort of exchange cigarettes uh, when they had to do it. Uh, this is the other fascinating thing, right? Like uh, whenever currencies seem to go out of trust or out of fashion, the uh, alternate seems to be either gold or cigarettes. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> like, you know, or, or, or currently, at least so far, the dollar, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah another are, currency, yeah. Like, you know, El Salvador, uh, not yep. even Argentina is, is contemplating dollarizing the economy. Correct. Right, you know, or pegging it to the dollar. Pegging as, it to yeah. the dollar. Actually, they, they want to dollarize the economy effectively. So, right. uh, so the, uh, so you're right that this is, uh, this is, and this, this tells you that the economy needs money. Uh, and uh, if the if the sovereign is not careful about how much money they print, it can actually cause a lot of instability and, and do a lot of economic damage. Right. Uh, right. So, a uh, couple of kind of sub, uh, further questions on this. So, first is, you know, in one of our previous episodes, you spoke about how banks create money. Uh, uh, so, so, one, if you can again kind of uh, talk about that a little bit and also there are lots of other institutions who are giving out loans like NBFCs and shadow banking sectors and so on and so forth. So, is that also creating money or then money creation is only restricted to banks and central banks? Okay, so how do banks create money? Yeah. Uh, so, suppose uh, I am the bank and uh, you are a borrower. So, suppose today, uh, right now, before I have given you a loan, uh, the total quantum of money in the system is 100. And I decide to give you a loan of 10 rupees. Now, what is the form in which I have given you? There is 10 rupees of deposits created in your account. Right. Now, suddenly, just because I gave you a 10 rupee loan, uh, the total amount of money in the system has become 110. Yep. Now, that deposit you can send to someone else and you know that starts to circulate. So, uh, this is how banks create money. Uh, they cannot do it in an unlimited fashion because uh, of, uh, you know, the, the restrictions that the central bank, which is the regulator for all banks, puts on the banks that you need to have a certain amount of uh, capital. So, you cannot just keep, you know, creating money out of thin air and keep building liabilities, right? Capital uh, and also, I guess, like SLR, LCR, those yes, things yes, also. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, 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 uh, uh, so, those are uh, drags, but, you know, in theory, you can... Uh, so, you are right that uh, if you have 100 rupees of deposits, you have to keep 4, 4.5 rupees uh, uh, in the CRR, the cash reserve ratio. You have to keep at least 17 rupees in the SLR, which is yes. in, the, in the government bonds. So, at most, you can then uh, lend out uh, 80 17, rupees. let's say. Yeah, so, 78 or 80 rupees, right? Now, but you can keep doing that, right? So, uh, and, and so, the real limit is actually how much capital uh, right. really have. Right? Capital right. meaning the how much equity base is, is, is that you have uh, at a very crude level. Correct. And to give, so hence central banks put put this restriction that if you to give out 100 rupees of loan, you need to have let's say 12 rupees of exactly. equity. equity. And so that is not just a credit risk measure, it's also a measure to kind of restrict infinite money supply creation. Is 100%. And, and also 
because banks are uh, by nature very vulnerable to runs. So, uh, having trust in the money and in the, in, the, in the piece of paper that gets circulated is important, but people have to trust the banks also. Right. Because and the way trust is created is because banks have put in 12 rupees of their own money. Correct. And so, first that money kind of disappears if something bad happens and hence people trust that you know, I can keep Absolutely. And, and, and the extreme example of this was, was when in 2008, when the financial firms in the US started tumbling, uh, what they found was that some of these firms had 3% uh, or 4% yep. uh, worth of equity. So, so even a 2-3% loss on the loans they had given wipes meant out that, equity uh, wipes and, then, out, and so the, yeah. the firm becomes unstable and then uh, people start pulling their money out of those institutions. Yeah. Or if you take the recent example of Silicon Valley Bank. Yes. Wherein basically the, actually it was not a loss, it was a uh, on paper loss because the loss was on bonds that they were holding because the interest rates went up. Correct. And just that interest rates going up, uh, people kind of crystallized in their minds the on paper losses and you know kind of pull money And then out. there was panic. Now, the, was panic you yes. could have said that look if they hold to maturity then you know that money would have still come back. But uh, what happened was that uh, too many people asked for their money back at the same time and the right. bank was not liquid enough right. and then they get on, got into trouble. On the second part of your question on uh, do non-banks also create money, they cannot, they do not. Right. right? Uh, and, and that is the reason why banks are so much more heavily regulated. Right. Non-banks are not. Right. Non-banks also have regulations, but they are not uh, as tightly regulated as banks are. Uh, Non-banks uh, do take on credit risk, but they cannot create money. So, okay. uh, for every rupee that they lend out, they have to borrow it from someone. Right. Okay. And so, because they are borrowing it from some deposit account, one more deposit is not created somewhere else. Exactly. So, they are Absolutely. just taking money from a bank and then giving it to someone else. Right. So, they are, they are, and they they just, are just intermediaries. Intermediaries. Right. So, I will go back to this inflation uh, point that uh, that you made, uh, uh, Nilkan. So, the, the way kind of the mental model that I have about inflation is that uh, there is money and there are goods. And if there is too much money chasing the same amount of goods, then, you know, kind of the value of the good goes up. And if there is too little money chasing the same amount of goods, then the value of the kind of good goes down, which means Correct. there is deflation. Deflation. Is that the right kind of way of thinking about this? Yes. Or? I mean, at a very simplistic level, I mean, absolutely, that is the way it works. So, that uh, if for, you know, as a thought experiment, if say, in our economy today, we increase the supply of money by 20%, uh, of course, many complex things will happen. This is never things happen in a straight line. But as the dust settles, what you will find is that the price of everything has gone up by 20%. Right. Understood. And so, hence, if we just kind of go to Western countries now, uh, is it then fair to say that because they have printed so much money, that is now reflecting in the inflation issues? And to solve the inflation issue, one of the things, like people talk about interest rates, but maybe the other thing they have to do is just to kind of… Uh, That's a very important point because um, we have been… Uh, you know, tracking money supply and M2 growth in the US, uh, though in most of academic literature over the last 15-20 years, uh, the quantity of money was never a thought, right? So it was, but there is research now which shows that when inflation is very low as it was for 20-25 years uh, in most of the Western world, then the, the quantity of money does not make that much of a difference. But when inflation starts to go up, then I think controlling the quantity of money is also very important. And uh, what we are seeing now in the US, uh, and because the dollar is such an important currency for the, for the whole world, uh, is that uh, not only is the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in the US, shrinking base money supply, so they are doing quantitative tightening, so they are reducing base money, but because interest rates have gone up so much, the the demand for loans has slowed as well. So, the money multiplier, the pace at which the banks uh, create money is also shrinking. So, the money multiplier is also likely to come down. So, from the peak uh, in sometime in 2021, the, the M2 level, so the broad money level in dollar terms is actually already down by nearly 1.3 trillion dollars. Uh, so, I think when we are when we are thinking about inflation and controlling of inflation, uh, especially from such high levels, that is a very important mechanism. Uh, what has already happened though, is that uh, because of inflation, 
right? So remember that uh, a lot of money was printed in 20 and 21 uh, and then they started doing tightening. But because price levels are already 15-20% higher, so uh, not too much of that correction needs to happen. So some of it is just because, I mean, so take uh, some, some commodity which was priced at 100 rupees uh, or 100 dollars uh, in 2020. Uh, it may already be worth $115 or $120 uh, because of three years of high inflation and therefore at least 20% of the extra money printing uh, has already already been absorbed. Yeah, yeah. understood. Uh, one more thought experiment, uh, Nilkan. So, let, like, let's assume that I am the only investor in this country and I have put 100 rupees into the Nifty. Now the Nifty goes up by 5%. Now, if I were the only investor, it will not happen but let's assume for some reason that it does go up by 5%. So now I have 105 rupees. But the central bank has not printed more money. Uh, so what happened? Like where did this money come from? And conversely, by the way, let's say if the 100 went to 90, then where did the uh, okay. money go? The the price of the, so if your wealth goes up, right? So if you think that uh, whatever was worth 100 rupees and you want to demand 105 rupees and that by itself is not of any use to you, right? Or for anyone who's holding that asset. If I have to pay 105 rupees for that, I need to have that money. Right. Now, if the money supply has not gone up, there is no way that I can I can pay you that price. Right. So, uh, just in fact, it plays out the other way. It is when uh, uh, there is a lot of excess money printing that asset prices go up. So, uh, uh, to give you another example, uh, and this is a fact that global wealth to GDP went up from 3.7 times in 2012 to 4.9 times in 2021. Wow, okay. Right now. So both by the way, the wealth to GDP is a ratio. So obviously the GDP itself has grown. grown. So the wealth actually grew far, far yes. more. Than in fact, there is, a, there is a very interesting way to look at wealth. Wealth is the current value of your future income. Yes. Of the, of the world as a whole. Yes. Right, because uh, if you take any kind of asset, uh, if it is uh, equities, then at least in theory, it is the discounted value of all the dividends yeah. that, that they can pay in the future. If it is bonds, it's about coupons. If it is real estate, it is about potential Very rent, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, and the fact that this went up was because that the interest rates were brought down and that there was so much of money being printed. So, the, the causality is the inverse of the way you frame the question. Uh, the way to, the, the way I would try to explain that, if the money printing is not, uh, the more money printing is not happening, the price of the asset will not go up. Right. But also in a... In, in, in aggregate. Right? In you know, aggregate, so, yeah, yes. So otherwise, there will always be relative values. So, I mean, if there are, say, five types of assets, some, and if some assets are becoming less productive, some are becoming more productive. So, there will always be ups and downs. But remember that there have been hundreds of years with no inflation. Right in history. I mean, it's only in the last 100, 150 years that we are starting to see sustained levels of inflation because policy preference has been that uh, that we you know, keep a certain level of inflation because that keeps the economy running much better. Uh, before that, when there was no, like, you know, uh, everything was back to the gold standard uh, and there was, there were, there were very different uh, monetary regimes in place, uh, there were centuries with no inflation. Right. But we still had stock market kind of or you know equity markets going up correct, and correct, other assets correct, going correct, up. Correct, correct. And also companies are creating value. So conceptually, you know, the uh, val the value of a certain company should keep going up if they are doing well. Uh, and so you are saying that if if the money supply did not increase, that would also not happen. Or that could happen, but that's a okay. Uh, so so let's look at. Uh, Again, coming back to wealth as the value of or the total wealth in a society or an economy is the is the discounted value of all future income. So if your if your GDP is growing because you're being much more productive, and money supply of course is keeping in is growing in line. If it does not, then there is a problem. Hmm. Yeah, then the economy itself is starts slowing down. slowing down, right? Right. So so if money so then uh, uh, wealth goes up in proportion to that. Right, and that should. There are, uh, the, the, this is where, you know, because, uh, uh, because these cycles play out over a very long period. Uh, so, uh, 
there are many uh, very interesting theories which have come up over the last uh, 200 300 years including whether the rates of interest you know are less than g uh, meaning the g meaning the gdp growth and r i mean the the rate of interest so if the the if, if the rate of interest is greater than growth then what happens to wealth what happens to future income so there are many complex things that uh, uh, i th there is a lot of debate among academics uh, but uh, put simply uh, it is it is uh, so you can see uh, the relative changes in asset prices if the money supply is not sort of boosted excessively uh, but if uh, gdp growth keeps happening then aggregate wealth also keeps growing keeps growing absolutely so changing tracks a little bit we'll take a little historical perspective you also kind of spoke about this uh, uh, in 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 the previous answer which is uh, till some time back the value the currency of a country was pegged to the gold reserves that they had uh, right and then there was Bretton Woods and you know that changed and so on and so forth. So just talk talk to us about that like how, how did it work earlier? What happened? Why did it change? What was the impact? So see for a local economy, it uh, if the economy is large enough meaning geographically large enough, it, it does not matter what the external value of the currency is. Right? So if you are say in rural Maharashtra you know rupee is the rupee right so it does not matter how rupee trades versus dollar or whatever uh, it is only when you're talking about international trade uh, that that some of these uh, you know pegging and you know gold reserves and all of that starts to play a role uh, there was a time though and and this is where you know this this myth and this uh, uh, the, the abstract nature of money becomes a problem that if the uh, if the ruler, the sovereign, is uh, issuing paper currency or say things which actually don't have that physical value, but he's calling it say one cent or one dollar or one pound, uh, but he does not have the gold reserve. So, so effectively, so when when you showed that I owe this person hundred rupees, it, it used to be that I owe this person so many sort of uh, ounces Ounce of, of gold, gold or uh, whatever, right? So, there was a time when that used to happen. Uh, uh, till more recently, so it was more about. Uh, when you're deciding the exchange rate between two different currencies, uh, on what basis do you decide what the exchange rate should be? And uh, so that is where I think gold reserves uh, became very important. So if there was a if there was a country which had a significant current account surplus, which is that they were producing more than they were consuming, then because they were sort of exporting a lot more, uh, they would get paid uh, in in gold and their gold would gold reserves would start going up the currency becomes stronger uh, and then their exports become less competitive imports become cheaper so then the current account starts to balance and the converse happens on the other side so this was how the, the economies used to work uh, if some government decided to print money excessively and trigger demand then automatically the imports would go up because you're consuming a lot more but you're producing more or less the same thing and then you start shedding your gold because you're running a current account deficit yeah? so you're, you're consuming more than you produce and then you start your, your gold reserves start dropping and your currency starts to devalue so at a very basic level these principles still apply but uh, what has happened is that because the total supply of gold in the world is is more or less fixed I and mean, there's still some gold mining happening but it cannot expand at the pace at which the economy is expanding so therefore uh, these innovations of paper currency digital money all of that have allowed countries to break out of the gold peg right that uh, and uh, that that because if you were pegged to to gold then you could only expand money supply at a certain at pace, certain pace yes. and and that was turning out to be a restrictive factor uh, in how fast your economies could grow. So, it, this is a little fundamental shift, right? Because earlier, like, no country could just print lots of currency yes. uh, because they had to kind of finally peg it to gold. Uh, now, after the Bretton Woods, uh, basically, gold is no longer in the picture. No, no, no. So, so the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, in 1945 was where uh, when they were deciding on the financial architecture, global financial architecture after the Second World War, 
uh, the agreement was that every currency will be pegged to the US dollar, right. will have a fixed exchange rate and uh, gold and the dollar would be pegged as well. So, uh, one ounce of gold would be worth $35 and this would be a fixed Correct. thing. And uh, so, in fact, uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, I mean, was the the, 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 the big man uh, with a lot of interesting ideas in the 1930s and 40s. So, he uh, had said even that at that time that this framework is not going to work. And the Bretton Woods Agreement started getting implemented by 1958. So, it, it you know, these international agreements take time, to, take time to get implemented. So, within four or five years, the problems had started. Yep. This is where uh, a, a Belgian American economist, John Triffin, uh, came up with this Triffin dilemma, which said that because all of the world's monetary expansion was effectively coming from the dollar, right? Because everything is funded the dollar, like pegged correct, to the dollar. dollar correct. So if the 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 there needed needed to be more supply of pounds, there needed to be more supply of dollars, right? Otherwise, the exchange rate would not be pegged the demand supply would not be fixed. And because then the dollar supply is going up, uh, the US would need to perpetually keep a current account deficit. Right? So, so, the country which becomes the reserve currency of the world or provides the reserve currency of the world has to, in order to keep supplying those dollars, remember that you know supply of dollars means that others You're are buying something. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and which means that you are perpetually keeping a current account deficit. Yep. Now, then how can you maintain a peg to gold? Because soon enough, you're going to run out of gold. Right. So, in the mid-60s, uh, John Triffin talked about the Triffin dilemma, that the country which is supplying all the money or is, is, is anchoring all the money supply for the world is going to run out of dollars, or run out of gold. And therefore, the gold peg cannot be maintained. And as it happened in 1971, uh, Nixon broke the peg to gold. Correct. After that, we have seen a new regime in international markets where we have, at least in theory, free floating currencies. But I think the underlying principles are still the same. Right. So, if a country becomes very irresponsible or at least the sovereign becomes very irresponsible and uh, 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 by money printing tries to sustain a level of demand which is far above uh, uh, what can be justified, then the currency itself starts getting devalued. Right. So this brings to me the brings to me brings me to the next next question that I wanted to ask, which is, uh, U.S. dollar is the so-called reserve currency, right? Yep. Like you hear this everywhere. Correct. So first, what does this mean? What is a reserve currency, and how did U.S. dollar come to be the uh, reserve currency? Uh, how it came to be the reserve currency was because they won the Second World War. Right. Right. Uh, and they were the largest economy in the world, and everyone trusted it. See. You will say if there are five people, and say there are five people around us who uh, all have different currencies, and we have to agree on one currency. Actually, let me take a step back. So, let us think about what a reserve currency means first. The first is the, the medium of exchange, right? That, that when you are doing trade invoicing, uh, you necessarily have to have exchange rates. Now, suppose there are 30 major currencies in the world. There are 30 major currencies which account for 85-90% of world GDP. Now, if all of these exchange rates, all of these 30 currencies have to have liquid exchange rates, you know what liquid exchange rates means that there is sufficient demand and supply at all times. So, if I want to convert from say uh, a, a rupee to a Turkish lira, uh, I should be able to do it, you know, in a liquid way. That and the, the least cost. Least cost, exactly. So, uh, and, and that I can do it whenever I want and at the lowest possible lowest. Uh, loss or gain. Now, maintaining, as a, you know, basic math will tell you, it's NC2, right? So, uh, basically, uh, 30 into 29 by 2, uh, number of exchange rates that need to be kept liquid. If, if you think about 20, uh, you know, so all of those yeah, yeah. Uh, crosses have to be kept liquid. If, on the other hand, all of us can agree that let us have one guy who we all trust is that is the most responsible. He may not be very responsible, but he is the most responsible. Uh, we will say let us maintain. So, then you only need 29 crosses. 
So whenever I want to convert from say the rupee to the lira, I convert from rupee to dollar because that's liquid and then there is a dollar to lira cross which is liquid. So I can convert with the lowest cost. So for the system having one currency in which everyone invoices or everyone has a liquid exchange rate with is most efficient. So that is one reason, uh, one way of uh, uh, quantifying a reserve currency. So because the US was uh, the, the, the biggest economy uh, and of course it was the dominant power uh, and also was the largest trading uh, country in the world, uh, it was a natural choice at that time. The second uh, aspect of being a reserve currency is that the signaling of safety. So what can happen just like we discussed runs on banks, they can be runs on countries. countries yeah. So any country will have uh, uh, foreign assets and will have foreign liabilities. Suppose I am a country and I have uh, say $100 of land uh, in Nigeria. And to, to buy that uh, or not to buy that for some other reason, I have say $80 of liabilities which are like loans which have to be repaid in two years. Now given that I have $100 of land and I have only $80 of liabilities, if I want to two years later borrow $80 from somewhere else and then repay that loan and it can work. But if suddenly people start doubting, the doubting whether, whether yeah. or whether that Nigerian land is worth it or not yep. uh, or my paper rights or whatever the, the rights are proper or not then no one will pay me money and then suddenly because of this liquidity problem I uh, my currency can start getting devalued. Now so to prevent that from happening uh, you have to signal that look I am a safe country that if you hold my currency or if you transact with me in my currency uh, uh, you will not lose money right and it will stay liquid and so to signal that people uh, or countries and mostly central banks start building up reserves. Now you would want to build reserves in, in currencies which are, which are considered stable by everyone else. And this is a classic network effect problem, right? And people are on some social media platforms because everyone else is on them. That may not be the mo best social media platform, but you are, you are there because everyone is there. And it's somewhat similar uh, in the case of uh, building foreign currency reserves that you want to build reserves in assets which everyone else thinks are safe. Uh, and because everyone else thinks they are safe, then they also become liquid and easily transactable. Uh, so that is how uh, the dollar has, has uh, turned out to be the, the favored currency in foreign currency reserves as well as in invoicing of trade transactions. Right. So there is this one, uh, one kind of line of thinking uh, uh, which says that uh, one reason for the dollar obviously to be the reserve currency is that largest economy and you know largest consumer of goods and hence you know anyway most trade is happening there so why not kind of extend it to others also. The other line of thinking is that actually the US dollar is uh, the reserve currency uh, because of uh, ease of you know taking money out in and out like there are no capital flows and you know uh, very very low cost and you know it's not like some like, like as an example in India it is very difficult to take uh, money out and so unlikely that India will ever be a uh, great… No, that's, ever is a very long time. Sure. Yeah. So in the current circumstances, unlikely that people will keep money in Indian yes. rupees because it's very difficult to kind of uh, uh, pull money out. Uh, and that before US actually became the global currency, actually the global reserve currency was dollar. Like while people may believe it was pound or whatever, but it was the ability of uh, the currency to kind of convert into gold that kind of determined it. So, and because this is the case, you know, there is also maybe next question we'll go there, which is, is there likely a move towards multiple reserve currencies or so on and so forth? Uh, but because of this, it's highly unlikely to happen. So now kind of your two So it is on. starting to shift. So uh, in, in, the shift is going to be glacial, but uh, the shift is very much underway. So very slow, maybe it will take 30, 50 years or something of that. Yeah, I mean, 30, 50 years may be too long, but, uh, but at least 10, 15 years right. if, uh, and most likely longer. The, the, the trade uh, flows uh, are now a lot more uh, uh, distributed than used to be the case 60, 70 years back. 
right so uh, so so asia for example as a trade block is now much larger in right. fact asia's global share of gdp has gone up significantly correct and so so the domination in terms of goods and services trade that that, that the us had is no longer uh, that clear right and it's it's no longer as as, as dominating uh, and therefore it is possible for a group of countries for uh, to start invoicing in in different uh, or in a local currency right so so for example say china and saudi arabia so there is a lot of oil that china buys from saudi arabia there is a lot of manufacturing goods that china supplies to saudi arabia so they can do their their uh, you know transaction in local currency provided trust and ease of uh, you Correct. know exchange etc correctly uh, so you can still do it right so for example say say the rupee uh, trade in oil with russia right. right so despite the fact that russia has a big surplus with india uh, a significant amount of invoicing has happened in rupees right right so uh, but so long as you're right that they trust that india will be responsible with the rupee and will not force a very rapid devaluation devaluation yeah uh, and and similarly uh, if china has to think about uh, uh, making an rmb or the, the cny uh, uh, the renminbi to uh, chinese yuan to become an alternative to the us dollar they have to uh, first keep it steady and stable so you cannot let it sort of be very volatile because then people start worrying about it second as you were saying earlier you need to keep open up your capital account so that people are comfortable holding uh, cny or assets which are sort of valued in cny uh, because if they are not and the capital account is not open then they'll always be circumspect about uh, oh if what if there were sudden restrictions then i will not be able to take my money out so uh, which is why these these things take take a while uh, to to shift right. remember that uh, the us became larger than the uk in economic size sometime in the 1880s 1883 84 or something like that uh, but the pound was still the reserve currency till 1932 33 and so till the time that they broke their peg to the dollar uh, to the to gold uh, the 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 pound was still uh, the reserve currency for international trading it's only after so it take, takes 40 50 years right. for or took 40 50 years right uh, and some event like world war was perhaps an event where you know uh, yes uh, well in 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 this case it was it was uh, i think the choice after the first world war to sort of peg the currency back to gold which led to you know problems in the uk economy right and and that created i mean so there are several monetary factors that that drove that but uh, but yeah it take it, it's not necessary that just because china's economy is big that it becomes an alternative uh, to the us dollar but remember that there are some other very interesting changes that are happening so we discussed the trifin dilemma right so there is also now that called the new trifin dilemma which is that one of the reasons that people feel comfortable holding uh, assets valued in us dollars like us treasuries or other types of assets is that they think that the the us government is serious about honoring its commitments meaning that if it has issued so there was at least an attempt uh, for the us government to keep its debt to gdp the sovereign debt to gdp ratio like how much how many dollars has it valued uh, as as it as it uh, borrowed and what is the economy which is supporting the size of the economy so that ratio is very important they were trying to keep it in a range but if you see the current projections over the next 10 years uh, the the us debt to gdp sovereign debt to gdp is likely to go significantly higher than it was even at the end of the second world war now if you have that level of uh, fiscal expansion uh, and and uh, debt to gdp increase then it is natural to assume that uh, the markets will start feeling a bit jittery about their ability to keep their dollar stable so if the if inflation in dollar terms so if in the us economy becomes very high uh, it uh some of these transitions can actually get accelerated right so the other uh, event will can which may trigger this also is in the recent uh, russia ukraine war uh, russia held about i don't know some 600 billion dollars of uh, reserves which are all in dollars and they were all seized 
uh, which basically means it's a it's a trust deficit because Russia did this believing that they will have free access to that money uh, as the reserve currency and that no longer exists. So that may be another event that could uh, fasten so this. So it definitely makes all central banks because one of the reasons why, like you know, if you look at India's total international assets, uh, about 900 billion dollars, uh, nearly 70% of that uh, is with the central bank and a very substantial part of that is in US dollars. Right. And the reason to actually hold assets which yield only about 2% in return um, uh, is that they are liquid and then, then, then you know, can be converted into money which uh, everyone uh, can Correct. use at a very short notice and freely. Now, if there is even a hint of a risk that uh, at some point that can become worthless or will not be usable, then it is natural that people will start diversifying away. And, and you are seeing that, right? So, uh, the, the, the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, holdings of US treasuries, the, the Saudi Arabian central bank's uh, holding of US treasuries has actually been starting to, as, as is starting to fall very substantially. So, they are diversifying their assets. Uh, in fact, even uh, the, the, the you know, central bank of uh, Israel, uh, so they have created a basket of currencies. So, they are Aussie dollar, CNY. Uh, so, uh, so that, that behavior is, is, I think, only accelerated by, by what happened in Russia. Fantastic. Uh, I'll shift topic to our last uh, last kind of uh, topic for the day, which is I go back to this 100 rupee note. Uh, this note is worth 100 rupees, but my guess is to print this note will cost maybe 1 rupee or 2 rupees, right? So, every time the central bank prints a 100 rupee note, they are making quote unquote a profit of let's say 98 rupees. And by the way, every time the Fed prints a 100 dollar, uh, obviously they are also kind of that may be in cents, so they are making maybe $99 of profit. And that profit is coming from the everybody who holds it. And a lot of dollars is held not only by Americans, but also yeah. Indians and Chinese and you know Saudi Arabians and so on and so forth. 80% plus of $100 notes are in circulation outside of the US. So, there you go. Yeah. So, 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 question number one and there is a question number two. Question number one is that it sounds to me that being a reserve currency is a bonanza. Uh, so, it will be good to hear your thoughts. And the second question is that uh, nothing in, in life is free, there is no free lunch. So, obviously, there is some rider attached to this, right? To uh, being a reserve currency obviously comes with some kind of uh, liabilities and some kind of uh, other uh, challenges. So, it will be great to hear that as well. So, the first is the issue of senior age, right? So, basically, as we, if you remember, uh, I mean, the, the, the first part of our conversation, uh, so being the ruler of a country gives you control of the mint and the army. And control of the mint means that you can call a piece of paper, whatever value that you want to give to it, and then you give it to someone and you can take something back in return as well. Now, what happens uh, in, in India, for example, is that uh, when the central bank prints money, they, uh, uh, they sort of give it to the banks, but in return, of course, they get either most likely government bonds, right? So, so on the balance sheet size, so if you think about the central bank's balance sheet, on the liability side is this, on the asset side, because they have given this currency to, to, to the bank, uh, they are getting, say, government bonds on this side. And so, the end, end of the year, uh, all the interest and the coupons that they get on the government bonds that they have on their balance sheet is then gi given as an issue of is a dividend given to the central government. Right? So that's the, that, that's the form of senior age. So earlier, the the government, the, the, the ruler would print the money and get all the returns. Now it is done through the central bank, but the concept is the same. As we discussed around the concept of the Triffin dilemma and the new Triffin dilemma, uh, if you if you are the reserve currency of the world. Uh, you need to have significant monetary expansion and you need to keep running a current account deficit, which is another reason why many people believe that China will struggle to become uh, a, a reserve currency because it's a continuous current account surplus country, right? So, it is very difficult. So, unless you start owing people a lot of money, uh, how do you become a reserve currency? So, uh, it is it, it is not a uh, very painless situation in the sense that you are continuously trying to maintain that balance, 
where like you know the net international investment position for the US is minus 50% of GDP in some of the earlier episodes we have discussed right. that. Now, uh, which means that there is like 12, 13 trillion dollars of net liabilities that the Americans have to the rest of the world. And if uh, once trust in the dollar breaks, then they actually have to repay it, right? And this, this becomes a huge challenge for the economy. So, uh, so it's, it's, there's no free lunch, as you said. Uh, and uh, so maintaining that balance where you have a current account deficit, but you are seen as credible, you have to maintain that credibility, which is why it is very important for the Federal Reserve, which is effectively the agency that everyone is relying on to keep the dollar stable, uh, is seen as credibly targeting 2% inflation. That when they are trying to do monetary tightening, they are, they are trying to, which is why, you know, in the first episode we discussed why the Fed may end up triggering a recession, whether it happens next year or second half next year or whenever. But uh, it is very important for the Federal Reserve to maintain that credibility because if they lose that credibility, the outcome for the rest of the world and the US would be pretty bad. Absolutely. So, essentially, uh, there is a lot of benefit because they get the seniorage and, you know, also… They consume a lot more than they can otherwise. They consume a lot more than they can. Their debt is always subscribed yes. uh, and so on and so forth. But also, maybe they are losing a little bit of control over their… Uh, local economy because yes. they have to keep running at a certain place. Correct. At the same time, they have to manage, uh, you know, level of inflation which is very stable. They have to be, uh, you know, uh, completely trusted, which means they can't impose any kind of controls and so on and so forth. Correct. And and uh, in many ways, uh, they are also a shock absorber for global cycles. Right. right. So so when when the global economy goes through a lot of uncertainty. Uh, everyone starts buying dollar assets because yeah. they think and so that push, pushes up the value of the dollar which means that the US economy or the manufacturers in the US economy or so exporters in the US economy become less competitive. Less competitive, correct. Right, so it effectively becomes like a shock absorber. Right. Uh, so it allows all the currency to depreciate and, and so on and so forth. Um, and and it's a provider of safe assets for the rest of the world as well. So, so imagine being a gold miner uh, in, in the middle ages, uh, in the medieval era. Uh, so, if you could control the supply of gold, uh, you could become very wealthy because the whole world ran on gold. Today, the whole world seems to be running on dollars and so as a supplier of dollars, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of value. But uh, I, I think that balance uh, and can create distortions. So, so for example, uh, the, the fact that they have adopted a loose fiscal tight monetary stance now is very important from the perspective of reducing inequality uh, within the US economy. Now, that may be politically necessary right now, internally, but I think it is creating a lot of risks on the external front. Fantastic. Fantastic conversation, Nilkant. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, it was lovely. I think for me, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, I think it's a topic that that's very difficult to put your arms around because it is so abstract. Yes. But also, money is just so central to life, right? Like we transact every day. Uh, and that just the notion that something that is so kind of here and now and so in our face, but also so abstract is, uh, is just fascinating. Thank you, Nilkant, for that conversation. Thank you for listening into this episode of Open Dialogue. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. We are overwhelmed by the response that we've received and really look forward to your comments and feedback. Do like and subscribe to our channel to keep track of new episodes that are coming through. Thank you.